Today we have this agenda. We start to explain a bit about what actually multi-party computation is, to make our title more comprehensive. And then uh, we will talk about uh, some specific things. We work um, in our uh, team in Switzerland, Ripple Switzerland. And uh, we will uh, dive into a couple of uh, examples of uh, multi-party computation uh, threshold signing. So I'm going to uh, take uh, I'm going to take first part of the uh, presentation. So let's talk about multi-party computation. Um, raise your hand if you know the main uh, cryptographic uh, method of uh, validating transactions in a blockchain. Okay, great. So it's a digital signature. So digital signature algorithm has been invented many, many years ago, at the time when uh, elliptic cryptography did not exist yet. And uh, nowadays, of course, we know that the blockchains use elliptic cri cryptography. So what are two main uh, algorithms of uh, elliptic uh, cryptography digital signing? Do we know? OK, so these are two algorithms, the CDSA and the DDSA. By the way, XRPL supports both of them. They're interchangeable. Uh, digital signature algorithm is uh, somewhat different from uh, classic uh, uh, encryption schemes because um, what we want to achieve by digital signing is first, we want to have um, message unforgeability. So we guarantee integrity of the message so the message cannot be, cannot be changed without changing the signature. Second, we achieve the message authentication, which means that we know when we verify the message, you know, case transaction, we know who actually signed it. And there is a third property which is uh, called non-repudiability, which basically means that who signed the transaction cannot deny that anymore. So in a the, in the uh, asymmetric cryptography scheme, in a public key cryptography scheme, we always have two keys. One of them is a secret key, another one is a public key. In case we produce a digital signature, the signer needs a secret key and the verifier needs a public key. Please know that uh, digital signature algorithm is uh, designed in such a way that it, it must be signed only once and verified a thousand times publicly. So there is no limitation, there is no uh, interactivity between uh, signer and uh, verifier. But what comes next is just realization that uh, the single secret key is basically a single point of failure. So if we keep this secret key in a not very uh, nice, uh, nicely protected environment, it can be stolen. And so therefore, digital signatures can be generated using the secret key, which essentially means the assets will be transferred by a malicious actor. So what, what we do first in multi-party computation is we split a secret key. What you can see uh, below is a formula which is the same as on previous slide. Here we have a relation between the secret key and, and, uh, and the public key. It is very easy actually to compute a public key from a secret key using uh, the uh, very simple algorithm on the elliptic curve. And here what you see is that from now on, to get the public key, you need a sum of secret keys. And it's not surprising that to generate a digital signature, you also need the sum of these secret keys. And I now imagine that these secret keys are shared with different parties. Each of these parties possesses one of these keys, but none of them can actually sign a transaction. They, do, they have to do some joint work to produce correct signature. And this is what we often call multi-party signing. Let's look very briefly at the uh, properties of uh, multi-party signing. Um, the property number one is that um, it's a protocol which involves multiple parties. Each party has private inputs. Those private inputs are never disclosed to any other parties. Remember the secret keys are some of them. However, the result of this computation 
will be known to every party. And it becomes public. We can call it public. We never reassemble the key in its full form in the multi-party. So, of course, the question uh, is how, how we do that. So, this is very, very simple uh, mathematics, um, which pertains to EDDSA signatures. It's a Schnorr signature. So, uh, the algorithm is super simple. Probably we don't need to go through all the steps. What you see in yellow is basically a formula for the signature itself. So, it has a random number R plus the result of the hashing of uh, some uh, public components, I repeat, public components, including M, which is a message or body of a transaction, multiplied by secret key. So that's our signature. Well, actually, to validate it, we also need to share R times G. And then the validation becomes very simple because we simply multiply S by G, and G is a base point on the elliptic curve, and we got the formula, eventually, where everything is public now. R is public, H is public, and public key is also public. All right, so the question is how do we do this without, uh, how do we do this in MPC uh, with the multiple key components without composing these key components into single key? It's also actually very simple. Each party generates that R, that, remember that random R. <coughs> and brings it to the, uh, the product of, uh, of R and G, then uh, outputs that. Every other party receives that thing, and what they jointly compute is just big R without indices. So this R becomes the same R as on the previous slide. Now, look carefully. The uh, first yellow line depicts uh, what one party can compute. It has only one secret key, secret key i, indexed by i. It has randomness ri, which is also private to the party, and it computes that si. But now, if you think what is the sum of si, it's actually this. And uh, where you see ri, the sum of ri, which is that. The sum of secret keys, which is that. So this signature is just the sum of uh, partial computations done by each party. However, this is a valid signature for that message M. Well, so far so good, but uh, well, this formula looks attractive. However, it requires all the parties to participate. So if you have uh, five shards, five key parts, then we need all the five parties. Well, fortunately, somewhere in 2017-2018, two prominent cryptographers from the uh, United States invented threshold algorithm. And this algorithm <laughs> is based on the mathematics of uh, Shamir Sikrichevin. Well, it's not that complex, but... Um, I'm not sure we need to go through all the details. I would better just illustrate it on the, on the picture. So uh, we've got uh, three parties here. Let's call it uh, Bob, Ellis, and uh, Lisa. So we can uh, think about uh, threshold signing where we don't need all three parties. But instead, we need only two of them. And if the key is generated in such a way, then only two of them jointly can compute valid signature. This is a very important property of uh, multi-party signing because it opens up uh, other possibilities, such as um, tackling uh, the problem of availability of nodes. And of course, um, we need to think a bit about what happens if we if you have three parties and uh, only two of them can sign. Now, first of all, um, to break the key, you still need two shards. The attacker needs two shards because we still need two parties to sign. So if number of parties 
which want to sign is less than two, then there is no signing. And so therefore, the, and, uh, um, so therefore, no leaking of the information of, of the uh, of the joint key. On the other hand, if, uh, for example, we have three parties and any two of them, in fact, can sign, but one of them just goes down for some reason. So either person is not available, or server is down, or network is broken. Then actually we tackle the problem of liveness. So that um, instead of choosing two signers randomly, we choose uh, now two which are available. And these are numbers which illustrate uh, basically the uh, trade-off between having a big T, and a T is a threshold, or small T. Um, what I have to stress upon with respect to MPC, there are quite complicated but yet explanatory um, security assumptions about MPC. So that uh, when uh, cryptographers design MPC protocols, they um, rely on certain assumptions. And the simplest one is that every party, of course, we, we keep in mind that there might be malicious parties, attackers who wants to key to be leaked or something like that. Um, so we rely upon uh, some assumptions. Like si very simple assumption is uh, that every party behaves honestly. We call this semi-honest attacker assumption, which means that there is attacker, but it behaves like uh, not, not an attacker. But instead, the attacker learns something from the protocol. So the attacker sees those big R's, for example, in the protocol and tries to figure out what, what, what to do with them. That's a semi -honest. But there might be an active attacker who tries to manipulate uh, the outputs uh, to, uh, to the advantage of the attack. So that um, this is more advanced model of uh, security. And there is an even more advanced model of security, for example, um, we have a model uh, called um, adaptive security corruption, which means that not only we have this uh, malicious uh, party in uh, consensus, but also this party, uh, not the uh, attacker, can actually extend the number of parties attacked during the protocol, which makes everything really, really complicated. Yet, we have protocols which are not susceptible to these types of attacks. And the last piece I want to touch upon is that there is a special security property, property related to parallel computation of signatures. So some protocols are not secure when multiple signatures are computed at the same time on the same machine using the same input keys. But others do, with, do withstand these attacks. So currently, in uh, our custodian software, we've got two protocols implemented uh, for ECDSA and EDDSA, and both of them are uh, universally composable so that they can execute multiple transaction, uh, transactions in the same moment of time, and they withstand uh, um, active corruption and uh, active uh, malicious attackers. And uh, from uh, this point, I would like to delegate the uh, slide deck to Tamas. Yes, perfect timing, thank you. So yes, practically, uh, so I will now talk about the engineering side of things, right? What, what you have heard from Oleg is basically mathematics of how MPC works and what's special and how do you deal with key shards, right? And remember that we work in Ripple custody. So basically, it's our, it's our job together to actually make this work in a custody product, right? And second, once it worked in custody, right, we have to make it work in a low latency application. So basically, transaction signing. I mean, that's really what the talk is really should be about, right? So I'm going to go over this briefly. Uh, again, practically, uh, when you deal with MPC, right, you have seen why the structure is different, right? You actually do something which, which radically differs from whatever uh, you considered in a typical thing. And again, the, the very practical challenge is that right now, if you want to issue a, uh, a digital signature, you basically call a library, end of story, it's a single call and whatever, right? In, a, in an MPC setting, what happens is you deal with a very small network. It's a small distributed network. I mean, all the participants that you have seen, they are basically nodes in the network. So that's, let's say that's something which is culturally foreign from the typical uh, crypto provider calls, right? And uh, again, practically speaking, the good news is that if you, are, if you take a large enough hammer, then actually you can make this disappear, and we'll show you how. 
And again, just, just really summary. Uh, there is one particular thing which is difficult to hide because MPC has got this particular property that you can actually roll over a key collection. You can take a key collection, you can regenerate new keys, and they basically form the same private key. Again, they, they form pri part of the same private key. This particular step has got no real application. There is no real counterpart in CSPs because once you have created the key, the key is there, immutable, end of story. So this is the part which is a bit challenging to deal with. But this is really the only part which doesn't really map 100% to CSP calls. Again, the challenge really is that, uh, f so first of all, you deal with multiple keys in, in some kind of larger context. And second, uh, let's say that you have extra latencies. ECDSA, so basically, again, multi-party competition by definition is slower because it does more stuff. And practically, again, because of this particular sketch that we are showing here, you end up dealing with this small distributed network, right? So practically speaking, the, well, this is actually how it's integrated into Ripple custody, right? The big frame around this, that's what it looks like to the rest of the system. They believe that they are creating a single signature. And what happens is beneath the covers, you actually have this smaller box here, which is basically multi-party computation. So essentially, you have got these nodes, one, one to N, right? There are some constellation of these nodes are cooperating to actually create a signature. And again, this part, so, so far to the outside, to the rest of Ripple software, it's all simple. You put in a box, it, it, can, it takes a bit slower, a bit, a bit longer to generate a signature, but it looks like a single signature operation, right? In practice, this is the part where people start to get nervous and where, where network engineers get crazy because Let's say a customer may say that, okay, this is really nice. Now I want to make sure that one node executes in Tokyo, one node executes in London, the third one executes in New York. This is actually a real customer request. And so practically, this part of the, of the computation is something that you need to uh, hide and abstract away. And if you are doing it, if you are doing it correctly, and we, we hope that we are doing it correctly, then uh, for the rest of the system, this is some networking detail. You actually have this problem in the key generation, but beyond that, you don't notice it. I mean, that's the way it is abstracted, right? But this is something that you have to be aware of, because if you, have to, if you ever need to take some kind of multi-party computation and, imp let's say, put it in your system, then this kind of stuff in the middle becomes a challenge. And there is actually a, a second challenge around this, and let me switch to that briefly. So the other, let's say, concern, or, or let's say the other observation that we have, remember that we, both of us are from the custody end of the business. Data at rest, again, uh, latencies, are, you, latencies are, are not critical. I mean, they are good if they are okay, but in practice, because custody means moving wallets and, 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 and whatnot, it's not really, a, a, an, op let's say it's not really a, uh, an operation that very, 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 very the nanoseconds matter, right? So basically part of the current challenge that we are facing with this, and this is, again, one of our points here, is that if you take a typical MPC setup and adapt it from custody to the transactional end of the business, then you actually have to sacrifice certain things. And that's, that's really what it is. Uh, in practice, what this means is you can build pretty much any arbitrary scheme of our MPC. In practice, people usually build two out of something, two out of three or something like that. This is something that people can deal with. It's operationally okay and practically it's secure because you need two guys to issue a signature, right? Uh, again, in practice, if you are looking at the lowest possible latency, because again, that's what payments require, right? Then you won't be able to go much beyond two out of two or two out of three. Uh, there are different flavors of the same thing, but practically, again, if you want to do this kind of MPC computation, then you will be really limited to one of these two, and, and that's it. Um, yeah, so again, and then, okay, so now, now we are moving into really just the three different kinds of, let's say, the most important kinds of MPC. If you look for MPC practical use in the literature, we'll find one of these. So the one in the bottom is the first one. This is Lindell. He's the, again, Lindell's work is what, what essentially made uh, and started the current wave of MPC. That's, again, he's the, he's the person who made this, his research made this practical. So he has got different evolutions and whatever in 2018 and 2020 are different revisions of Lindell's work. I mean, this sort of came back, it, it was through Unbound. So basically, again, one of the Unbound products. And this was sort of evolving over time. Both of these are suitable. So again, we, we mentioned this because if somebody asks about Lindell MPC, again, here's the answer, this sort of works. It's not ideal for our setting, but it does work. Um, uh, alternatives, and these are the two that are relevant, right? Dernier, this is one particular thing. It's based on a weird MPC primitive. There are different ways of phrasing everything that Oleg has described. This is a, a somewhat weird and unusual thing. And it's not really popular because if you have multiple, so if you are, if you are scaling this to beyond two or three participants, it gets unwieldy because lots of bytes need to fly back and forth. 
Uh, but in practice, for a restricted set, it's close enough, right? Because we are, we are not really interested in anything beyond two out of three. So Derner is actually a good thing. Uh, again, we will have the reference in the end. Again, it's worth mentioning because in this particular setting, this question might come up, and here's the answer. Derner will work. And CMP, and this is the uh, out of the three, this is the one which is, which is less ideal. A CMP is basically the algorithm that everybody associates with the MPC these days. And it's a nice thing because, it, as Oleg mentioned, there are different levels of who do you trust in the network and how do you trust them and, and that kind of stuff. And CMP is really great in resisting all kinds of weirdness. The problem is that even if you scale it down to two signers, so the absolute minimum, it still becomes very heavy. Uh, I don't believe we have exact numbers for it, but it's order of magnitude worse than Werner. So it's just not great. Uh, and the two out of two and two out of three honestly makes very little difference from procedural side, right? Uh, the difference being is that if you go for two out of two, again, you only have two key parts. If you lose one of them, end of story, you cannot sign. Two out of three is something which procedurally you don't need to do. Uh, use, let's say, the third shard during operations, right? But two out of three, if you pick one of these uh, and, and add up two out of three, then you can either do something like code storage or put the third part in escrow or give it to somebody else or put it, again, so basically you can put it elsewhere. Two out of three gives you some kind of resiliency, which two out of two doesn't. So that's, that's really what, what matters, right? And, okay, so uh, trade-offs. So basically from an engineering perspective, right? Again, two out of two and two of three, they, they really don't differ that much. It's pretty much the same thing. You need two cooperating guys. As long as they both hit OK in the sequence, everybody's happy. Again, two out of three is really just a resiliency difference. Uh, now, the big problem is, and this is something which is worth mentioning, uh, so MPC literature assumes that pretty much nobody trusts anybody, right? It's, it's, it's totally a, a distrustful word, all that kind of weird things. And one of the things which is worth pointing out, BFT, so Byzantine fault tolerance, that, you, that the system operates and, and, let's say, tolerates some kind of loss, right? I mean, that's a prereq. It's, it's one of the MPC uh, assumptions that people do. And the real problem that you have is if you do two out of two, you cannot get that because basically any single party can prevent the uh, signature from being issued. Now, okay, uh, in the digital assets industry, this is probably not always a bad thing because basically, uh, let's say, usually, if you consider something like this, Again, if a denial of service keeps somebody, so basically if, if the price for not allowing somebody to transfer a million dollars in a single transaction somewhere maliciously, and the price for that is that you can have denial of service, I mean, again, you won't be able to transact, but nobody's stealing your money. So, so it's sort of, I mean, this is a gray area here, but, but in practice, this restriction on MPC that you, again, if you are restricting yourself with the low latency, you cannot solve this at the same time. That's just something that you have to live with. Uh, okay, uh, comment on that. It really depends on how the MPC, uh, let's say, operations are integrated. It might be possible that there is some kind of higher level control or something which, let's say, uh, allows you to route around this, uh, let's say, uh, denial of service problem. So, again, that's, that may be something. Uh, okay, HD wallets. So this is just other things. Uh, HD wallets are a thing, right? This is hierarchical derivation where you take a seed and you basically descend into a key hierarchy. This is something that is possible with MPC. There is some fine print. It's not binary comp compatible with, again, non-MPC HD, but this kind of stuff exists. And the reason this is worth mentioning is because if you can do that, then you can actually, again, deal with large key collections using, let's say, a smaller amount of storage. So this is really why HD matters, right? Uh, so again, it's, it's worth pointing out that you can have HD-like structures. You can basically emulate BIP32 or SLIP10 wallets over MPC, so that's actually technically possible. It's just not, uh, again, it, it, it's not binary compatible. It's flow from a flow and, again, re, uh, prereqs and security assumptions all the same. It's just like HD. You can keep, start with the base key and do the derivation. It's just, it won't be binary compatible, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, this is just a brief thing. Uh, so trusted hardware, if you consider MPC, where we are basically trusting, let's say, a, a collection of nodes, but none of, none of them very particular, right? We can allow you lose any single one. This is the total opposite of trusted hardware, right? Trusted hardware assumes that we have got something very well protected, very well access controlled, and we never lose it, so whatever. So, and if you can do MPC in such a way that you do the computation in your, again, in your software thing, and you do some of it in hardware, then you end up in the best of all worlds because you are combining security. So if this is possible, this is good. 
Okay, uh, very quickly, uh, you have multi-signature. This is actually supported by XRPL, uh, so basically XRP Ledger does this. The difference is that with MPC, uh, policy, quorum, that kind of stuff that's embedded into the signature, right? Once you got the signature, it implies that this has been done at signing time. With, with MPC, well, with multi-signature, this is not the case. You, you get a key collection, everybody signs, and you do that at evaluation time. So that's basically it, and we are almost on time, exactly. So these are the references. Uh, again, these are the first three. Those are basically the, the MPC arguments. If you are looking for MPC, chances are we'll find one of them ensured. So if it's not specified, it's one of them. And the third one is CMP. That's pretty much the golden standard that everybody's looking for. And the other two are actually, uh, let's say, references which are about, okay, why does it, why does HD, why this kind of, let's say, hierarchy decomposition, why is that a challenge for MPC? This is more, let's say, this is of less of generic interest. If you are looking for MPC, you will find the first three. This is very specific, and I believe this is where we are at the questions. Yes, so anybody has any questions so far? Yes? What are the advantages of using MPC over multisig? Was one one of my questions. Just, just to like hear it again, and then yes, and then the, and then the the other thing is, <clears throat> you said that that HD extension that you put, it make it means that it's API compatible but not binary compatible. Yes. So what challenges in in the real world does that create, um, and when when is that trade off okay. justified? I apologize. So I, I, this will be one paragraph and the second one, and then we're going into this in detail. So the HD one, the challenge is that for, for real HD, if you want to binary compatible implement HD, whatever, you need to have a single key thrown into a cryptographic operation, basically, that you need to be able to Mac, right? And this is something that you don't have. So in, a, in an MPC case, you don't never reassemble the keys, part of the central tenets, right? And therefore, we can approximate it under the same security assumptions, but it will be just not the same flow, because simply you won't be able to reassemble the key. So that's problem number one. Again, this is the multisig thing. And again, remember, multisig is supported by XRPL, right? So basically, the Ripple networks already supports multisignatures. The challenge is that when you support multi-signatures, you actually have a field with, you get a response which is signed by some number of signers, right? It's coming from a signer list, so basically it's a, it's a trusted list which is an offline thing. And then the problem is that you rely on policy checking when you do the evaluation, right? So in multi-sig, this is basically the case. In, C in MPC, you actually enforce all this kind of policy checking while you do the signatures and you assemble them. And then when you get the signatures, a single signature, no need for multi-signature fields and all that kind of stuff and no need for policy checking, right? Because it's all done during construction time. Okay.